Hello and welcome to online services at North Park Community Church. God is with you today and God is with us today as we worship. So won't you join in and sing with us? Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? When we come to worship God, it's, it's important for us to, like, to not pretend that our relationship with Him is always perfect. 
And so I invite you to pray this simple prayer along with me. It's a prayer of confession based on Psalm 25, verses 4 to 7. The words will be on the screen, and let's all read this together. And then as we finish reading it, let's just take a moment of silent prayer to just be open and confess as the Lord today. So Psalm 25, it says, Remember, O Lord, your compassion and unfailing love which you have shown from long ages past. For the honor of your name, have mercy on me and forgive my sins. Remember me in the light of your unfailing love, for you are merciful, O Lord. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come Oh come to the altar Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. is calling bring your sorrows bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life was born as Jesus is calling he's calling out oh come to the altar your father's Whenever we've confessed our sin to God, it's always good to be reminded of God's faithfulness, His faithfulness in forgiving us. We read Psalm 25 earlier, and Psalm 25 continues at verse 8, saying, The Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. So let me remind you this morning, if you feel you've gone astray, in Christ, you are forgiven. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ. 
Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. We're going to teach a new song today. And um, this song reminds us, just as Philippians 2 at verse 13, it's God who is at work in us. It is Christ in us and Christ at work through us. So we're going to sing this song, and as it becomes familiar, join in and sing with us.
Well, hello, my name is Trish Hack. I'm the pastor of care ministry here at North Park, and I'm so glad to be here with you uh, today for this online service. Uh, coming up, I'll have some updates to share with you uh, about some things happening this fall. We'll hear from Paul as he continues in our sermon series on what we believe, and we'll be sharing in a time of communion together. Uh, but first, I'd like to just turn things over to Wesley and Wilma Prescott, who are going to lead us in a time of prayer. Let me join Pastor Trish in thanking you for joining us in our time of worship. Willem and I are going to pray the congregational prayer, but we want you, the congregation, to participate in this prayer. So in a moment, you will see two verses of scripture that reminds us who God is. And we want you to read those two scriptures with us. Then I will pray a prayer of thanksgiving and Wilma will pray a prayer of supplications and at the very end of our prayer we want you to join us we want you to join us in a loud amen so read with me holy holy holy, holy is, is the lord, lord almighty the whole earth is full of his glory who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that you made us a way to reconcile us a people born in sin and conceived in iniquity to you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who indwells us, teaching us all good things and advocating on our behalf. We thank you for the leadership that you have provided us at North Park, the elders and their family, the senior leadership team, the pastoral administrative and custodial staff, the many, many volunteers across many ministries at North Park. We are truly blessed. Thank you for everyone who's participating in this time of worship. May their participation go beyond listening to acts of service. May their lives, may our lives be changed as we live out what we say we believe. In spite of our physical separation, may we all feel loved. May we know that we are all important. May we know that you have a purpose for our lives, even in the midst of the pandemic. Amen. We pray for wisdom for everyone that's involved in the restarting of various on-site programs at North Park. Everyone has a role to play in the safety of these programs. May they operate with integrity and love. May those who are participating feel safe, loved, and cared for, even if they can't see the smile behind the mask. As school, colleges, and university reopen, the spread of COVID is very much a concern that affects all of us. We are praying for protection for our children their teachers, their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents. Father, we have many in our congregation who are going through difficult times that may be caused by or exaggerated by the pandemic. We pray for many of our congregation that are physically ill or shut in, for whom visits by family, friends, and our care team are very limited. And may they feel your presence and your love there are many in our congregation suffering with anxiety depression or mourning because of various losses may you comfort them may you give them hope that the sun will shine in their lives again thank you for hearing and answering our prayer and as god god's people say amen, amen. So as you might already know, we have a lot going on this fall. Um, lots of things on site here at North Park as well as online. And um, we've got uh, youth and young professionals and adult discipleship 
discipleship electives that have already started running. And uh, we hope that these ways of engaging have um, provided opportunities for you to connect and to grow here at North Park. For a full list of all that's happening, we just want to encourage you to go online to northpark.ca slash register, and you'll be able to see all of the events that are running uh, and be able to connect in. And we do encourage you to register early because for most of our on-site events, there are uh, limited spaces available. Today, I just want to highlight a few things for you, uh, starting with our care groups. And so our care groups uh, this fall are meeting uh, completely online. We've, we've found this to work really, really well. And it just ensures that that lifeline of support is available, kind of regardless of what's happening out in the world, people can connect in. And so, um, and if you can imagine, you know, to go through a marriage breakdown or a cancer diagnosis or to lose a loved one uh, in this season that's already so painful and difficult, um, it's it's really hard and so we're we're um, so grateful to be able to offer these um, support groups to provide people with the help and the hope that they need so um, if this fits for you or for someone that you know we hope you'll consider connecting in with one of these groups Another area that is um, just foundational to our community here at North Park is prayer. And so I wanna make sure that you know that we're continuing to meet online for prayer twice a month this fall uh, on the second and the fourth Tuesday of every, sorry, Wednesday of every month uh, from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And all you have to do is register and we'll send you the link and we would love to have you join us for that. Uh, I'm excited to tell you we're also adding in a an on-site prayer gathering once a month here at North Park, and this is going to be on the first Tuesday of the month. So we'll have our first one on October 6th, and we're really looking forward to just um, gathering together and lifting up our voices together in prayer to God. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, another important part of community is small groups, and um, I know I've heard from many of you that you've got a group that you've been either connecting online or you've had um, the right kind of space or opportunity to meet outside. Uh, and so small groups have been continuing to meet. Uh, but we know that there are many of you out there who would love to have, um, to make that kind of small group connection and have that encouragement in your uh, faith and your walk with God. Um, and so we wanna make sure there are opportunities for that. So we'll be having an on-site uh, community group meeting twice a month and you can register online for that. That will be Tuesday evenings, twice a month. Um, and and we're also working on some new online opportunities that I'm really excited about. Uh, they're not quite ready yet, so you'll have to wait to find out more, but uh, we just wanna make sure that there are some uh, excellent ways for you to connect with one another, to encourage, to pray for each other, and to grow in your faith. So stay tuned for more about that. Um, and if you have a small group that's been maybe meeting outside or making it work, but you're interested in maybe gathering inside but want to do that safely, I would love to hear from you. You can email trish.hack at northpark.ca. Um, and I've got a few spots available still um, for small groups to meet here at the church. So I would love to hear from you. Um, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to share with you. Uh, now in a, in a little bit, we're gonna share communion together. So uh, we hope that you will get some uh, bread or crackers ready along with some juice or some wine so you can share in that time together with us. I'll also mention that usually when we are uh, in person, uh, the communion weekend is the weekend that we would uh, pass around an offering plate. And so uh, we know we're not doing that right now, but it is this weekend a wonderful opportunity just to say thank you, North Park Church, for your generosity. Um, it is often overwhelming to us the way that you have continued to faithfully give through online, uh, through uh, putting you know a donation in the mail, uh, and even just driving right up to the church and dropping something off. It is such a blessing to us in the ministry that we do here at North Park. Um, I think that covers everything. And so uh, just before we share in communion together, we're gonna hear from Paul as he uh, continues to teach us and walk us through our statement of faith. And we just hope and pray that it will be an encouragement and a blessing to you today. Welcome to North Park's online worship service. My name is Paul McRae, teaching pastor. It's so good to have you with us today. Well, later in his career, Irish playwright Samuel Beckett, perhaps best known for his play Waiting for Godot, produced a work called Breath. 
Unlike some of his previous work, it was a minimalistic piece that lasted a grand total of 35 seconds. It began with the sound of a baby crying and then followed by an amplified recording of someone inhaling and exhaling as the lights on the stage increased and decreased in intensity. After this, there was the sound of an old man's last dying gasp and then the curtain closes and the play ends. Through this brief production, no actors were seen on stage, but Beckett instructed that the floor be littered with various pieces of trash. Strange, wouldn't you agree? Beckett's point in this whole production, life is absurd, humanity is meaningless, and our existence is pointless. We are born, then we wait around for something to happen, when usually it doesn't happen, and then we die. Birth is the death of us. How's that for a pick-me-up today? Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard has compared this view of life to that smooth, flat stone that's thrown across the surface of a pond. The stone kind of dances and skims across the top of the water until that inevitable point comes when it loses momentum, it runs out of steam, and it sinks into nothingness. It's gone. And that's what life is like without hope. And we know people all around us that live like that, don't we? They try to find meaning in things or in accomplishments or in pleasures, but that sort of living fizzes out eventually like that stone on the water, and they sink into the depths of despair, longing for some sort of deeper purpose for their life. The writer of the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes says it best in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, I've become greater than all who have lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I worked so hard to to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like a chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. So what do you find worthwhile? Where do you find meaning for your life? Where does your hope come from? I mean, when those inevitable storms of life seek to batter you, where do you get your anchor? The world around us can be harsh sometimes, wouldn't you agree? I mean, we know that firsthand, and I think we'd all agree that the year 2020 and everything that's come with it, well, it can leave any time, right? In a study conducted by the Canadian Mental Health Association, they found that instances of people contemplating suicide have tripled in the summer of 2020 over 2019. And the main reason? COVID. And young adults, they've been hit especially hard during this season when it comes to their mental health. For millennials and Gen Zers, their future has never looked dimmer. Job prospects and future financial stability for that generation has taken a beating. Research shows that they're the ones that are experiencing the most anxiety. And many of you have felt the strain during these unprecedented times. But what is it that gives you the fortitude to be able to ride out the frustrations and the disappointments and trust and believe that there's a better day ahead? And that's what our sermon is about today. As many of you know, we're in the third week of a teaching series that we launched in the fall that's entitled, We Believe, Exploring Our Statement of Faith. Given all the uncertainty and all the change that's going on in our world today, we thought it would be good just to remind ourselves of what we believe as a church. What are the essential truths, and how does that affect the way that we live and the way that we engage with others and our community? See, at North Park Church, we have a statement of faith, which is just simply an explanation of what we believe. About a year ago, the elders decided that it would be good to revisit this document and just see that it represents our current reality. So some staff, some elders, and some of our congregations spent a number of weeks just combing over the document, making some changes where needed. It was then presented to the elder board and then the congregation for approval. And that statement now serves as what North Park Church believes. In the first two messages in the series, we spent some time explaining the preamble and then looking at the four, first four statements of faith. Let me just read them to you as way of review. North Park is a non-denominational Christian church. With the whole church, we affirm the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed as foundational summaries of the Christian faith. We believe that there is one true God, the creator and sustainer of all that is, who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
God's original creation was perfect, but the first human sinned against God by willful disobedience and passed on a corrupted nature to all of humanity. Our sin alienates us from God and brings us under his condemnation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God's only Son, was born of the Virgin Mary, is truly divine and truly human, yet is without sin. Jesus died in our place, reconciling sinful humanity to God and offers salvation as a gift received by faith. And that's what brings us to statement number five. And this is the essence of our Christian hope. Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven and is the mediator between humanity and God the Father. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a situation where someone has said to you, prove it? In other words, I want you to verify the claims that you're making. I was watching an interview with a politician on TV this past week. A reporter asked the politician a question. And once the answer was given, the reporter followed up that question with another question. In effect, what he was saying to this politician is, prove it. I want you to verify the claims that you're making. And what ensued was a very interesting conversation. For the past two years, my youngest son has been completing his master's degree at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, and a large component of his schooling has been around a research study that he conducted on the physical fitness levels of middle-aged adults, like me. This past week, he had to sit in front of a group of professors and give a defense of the conclusions based on his research. For two hours, he was peppered and he was bombarded with questions that basically wanted him to prove it to verify everything that he's written in his thesis paper. Now, if you've ever experienced something like that, then you know that it certainly forces you to get an understanding of what it is that you will believe. And we're faced with these prove-it moments often in our life, maybe sometimes without even realizing it. As parents, it happens with the exchanges we have with our children when they question a decision that we make. At work, it's when a boss wants a review of a project that we've been involved with. At school, it's when a teacher gives us a test. They're looking for proof that we have an understanding of the material that's been taught. Prove it. See, we live in a world that needs some sort of validation of what we claim to be true. Do you agree with that? So let's just say that I walked around amongst you and around our congregation, and I said, you know what? I am the Son of God. I came to live in human form to show you how to live and to call you back into relationship with God. If I made that claim to you, you would have every right to say to me, prove it, wouldn't you? And that's basically what happened to Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, at verse 38, it says, One day some teachers of religious law and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a miraculous sign that will prove your authority. And over and over again, people pestered Jesus to prove the claims that he was making. And throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus performed a stunning array of miracles from walking on water to raising the dead. See, Jesus uh, shut down and silenced his fair share of skeptics, but he raised the stakes even further. Jesus laid out a specific proof to validate that he truly was the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And we as Christians have viewed this as the litmus test, that he passed that test, and the entire world has been talking about it and writing about and teaching about it for the past 2,000 years. His big proof, Jesus was raised from the dead. It's his resurrection. See, Jesus told people all along that he was going to do it. It was to be the confirmation that he was who he said he was. In in response to the religious leaders of the question that they asked him to prove his authority, remember I asked a few minutes ago in Matthew 12? Listen to what Jesus responds at verse 39. Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation will demand a miraculous sign, but the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights." See, here Jesus is making a comment that sort of foreshadows his impending death and resurrection. At another point, he pulls his disciples aside, and he says to them in Luke 18 at verse 31, Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem, where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Romans, he will be mocked and treated shamefully and spit upon. They will flog him with a whip and kill him, but on the third day he will rise again. 
See, over and over again, Jesus made it clear that the one sign that the world could test him by was whether or not he would rise from the dead. Whether or not Jesus was raised from the dead means everything to us, doesn't it? Our very faith is contingent upon it. Let me ask you, ever heard of a guy named Simon Magnus? Oh, he's in the Bible. Maybe you know him better as Simon the Sorcerer. His confrontation with Peter is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 8. Oh, this Simon guy, he had a bit of power, he had some followers, and at one time he even claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the second coming of Jesus. But then he died, and that was that. In fact, in the decades before Jesus' birth and, and death, there were dozens of people in Israel who claimed to be the Messiah, the promised one of God who would save the people. And in almost every case, the leader was killed, the followers dispersed, and the movement fizzled out. Of these dozens of movements, only one did not collapse after the death of their leader. Not only didn't it collapse, but it actually exploded. And that movement was called the Way, and its leader, Jesus Christ. He did what he said he would do. He rose from the dead. And no matter how hard people have tried to discount this miraculous event with conspiracy theories like, oh, the disciples hid his body, or the Roman authorities stole his body from the tomb, or, or Jesus faked his death. Yeah, that's it. He didn't really die. You know, after being beaten to a pulp and hung on a cross and, and jammed through with a spear, he actually recovered. All those theories have been discounted. There is no single historical event that has faced such scrutiny and yet has weathered the storm and stood the test of time. More books have been written, research done, and attention has been given to the resurrection of Jesus, and nothing has been able to refute the evidence that it happened. See, the early followers of Jesus, and this one's important, so get this. The early followers of Jesus did not make up the story of the empty tomb and sightings of the risen Jesus to explain a faith that they already had. Christianity didn't exist yet. Oh, up to that time, they were simply following a unique man that did marvelous teaching and made amazing claims about himself. But it was because of the resurrection that their faith developed and Christianity began. The resurrection of Jesus is the very foundation of our faith as Christians. I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 17. He says this, And if Christ had not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. See, Jesus' resurrection authenticates his ministry and his promises. He proved it. He's done his time. He paid in full our debt. Remember what we talked about last week. Jesus went to the cross to pay our penalty the, the penalty that our sins deserve. We deserve death, and yet Jesus subbed in for us. Why? Because he so loves us. And through that act, his death and resurrection, he has restored us back into relationship with God. We're acquitted of our sins, and we are reconciled back into relationship with our Heavenly Father. All we need to do is receive this gift through faith and through repentance. See, Jesus' death, it means no death for us. His resurrection means our resurrection. We have new life. We have a new way to live in him, not just heaven one day, but right here and right now. And it is this new life that offers our lives meaning and purpose and hope. See, the world can zap it from us so quickly, can it? They can take meaning from our lives so quickly. It can have us to believe that life is so pointless and so futile, like Samuel Beckett's play, Breath and the sentiment that birth is the death of us. But 2,000 years ago, the power of God was reflected in this one single action of raising Jesus from the dead. And humanity, we've been changed ever since. See, there's no greater power in heaven and on earth than power over death. And the Bible tells us that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. It's available for our lives. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the event of the resurrection means that the Bible isn't just a great read. It isn't just a great narrative. But it's become personal. It gives us that life-changing power. And I'll talk more about that in a few moments. Look at how statement number five goes on. Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. Now again, Jesus told his followers all along that he would one day go and be beside his heavenly Father. It's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, and it's mentioned in Acts 1 at verse 9. It says that after Jesus' death and resurrection, he gave a few final instructions to his followers, and then he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching. 
and they could see him no longer. Now, let me give a little caveat because this is important, a bit of a side note. Notice that it uses the word up here. That's not necessarily a geographical transition, but it's a spiritual one. Luke uses the word up in this passage because this is the way the disciples would have perceived it. They are up on a mountainside watching all of this happen. They see and appears to be Jesus going up. But heaven is a spiritual realm. It's not a geographical one. And I'm going to expand on that point in the final message of this series. So Jesus' ascension to the Heavenly Father is so important for many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that it prompted the sending of the Holy Spirit to be with us. You see, that event could not happen if Jesus had not returned to his Father. In John 16, at verse 7, Jesus says to his followers, It is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I'll send him to you. See, the ascension was the important transition from Jesus' public ministry on earth where he was restricted by time and space to the new age of ministry of the Spirit where Jesus is free to be present with everyone in every place, in every age. And there's this wonderful description given in the book of Acts. Now, unfortunately, it occurs during the martyrdom of one of the early Christians, Stephen, On the brink of of death after being stoned for his faith in Jesus, Stephen has this vision that's described in Acts 7 at verse 56. Listen to what he says. Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. What Stephen saw there was the return of the Son to the glory that he had with the Father even before the world began, where he is the, get this, the mediator between humanity and God the Father. You ever been a mediator between two parties? See, a mediator is a person who, through the use of attentive communication skills and specialized negotiation techniques, attempts to lead people who are involved in a conflict back into community with one another, into a resolution. They're like a third person, maybe a go-between. Now, parents, I believe that you know this role well. How many times have you been called to settle a a dispute between your children? Mom, tell Johnny it's my turn on Mario Kart. Or Dad, tell Susie that I get the car tonight. And you try to be patient, right? You sit them both down and you you get them to share their side of the story. You listen well and and actually the conflict almost resolves itself, right? (laughs) I don't think so. How many times have your specialized negotiation skills as a parent involved go into your rooms and settle this thing yourself? See, I can relate. I've been there. But mediation is being used more and more in our world today. When workers and their employer are locked in a labor dispute, a stalemate, and the threat of a strike is a real possibility, they call in a mediator. More and more, mediators are being used in place of lawyers to settle family disputes and divorce settlements. And I've been called on numerous occasions as in my position as a pastor to mediate between two parties that can't resolve a dispute themselves. And let me tell you, the role of a mediator, man, it's difficult. You have to listen well. You have to ensure that you're unbiased and that you understand the perspective of each side. Jesus is the mediator between humanity and our Heavenly Father. From his exalted position at the right-hand side of the Father, Jesus is actively performing this role of mediator between humanity and God, and he does it in at least three ways. The first way, it's by his guidance. Remember, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus reminds his followers of what he taught, and he enhances our understanding of what it means to live as Christians in our world today. That is one means in which Jesus mediates It's through his guidance. Number two, it's through his righteousness. See, when condemnation and shame seeks to overwhelm our lives, given the world in which we live in, Jesus inserts his righteousness for our deliverance. In Hebrews 10 at verse 22, it says this, For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. And the third way that Jesus mediates is by his authority. Remember he told his disciples before he ascended into heaven, all power on heaven and earth has been given to me. He has the authority to step in on our behalf and to mediate for our best interests. He is our mediator. So Jesus' resurrection proves that he is who he said he is, that he's the son of God, he's the savior of the world. 
His ascension represents that the Holy Spirit has now come to earth and it lives in each one of us to care for us, to convict us, and to give us power. And Jesus mediates between God and humanity in three, at least three ways, through his guidance, through his righteousness, and through his authority. And that is an explanation of statement number five of what we believe is a church. Jesus was raised from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is a mediator between humanity and God the Father. See, this statement, it's what gives us hope and meaning in our lives, that unlike what Samuel Beckett was getting at in his play, Breath, birth is not the death of us. Our new birth in Christ is the beginning of the mission that God has for our lives, to love him and to love others through our words and through our actions. See, each day that we're alive, God continues to be at work in our lives, refining us and shaping us to become more like him and to use us for his good purposes. And that's what leads us to statement number six. The Holy Spirit, who is the eternal Son of God, leads people to repentance, lives in them, and is transforming them to be more like Jesus. Do you remember a few weeks ago we talked about this concept of the Trinity, that the Holy Spirit shares the very essence of Father and Son, and therefore he is able to reproduce in us the character of Jesus the Son, who is the perfect image of God the Father. Now, as I stated earlier, there is no greater power in heaven or on earth than the power over death. And the Bible tells us that that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us. It's available for our lives. In Ephesians 1 at verse 19, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Now, it's interesting, the word power used in this passage is the original Greek word dunamis. Now, maybe that word sounds familiar to you. It's where we get our word dynamite. It's the same word that was often used to describe Jesus' miracles in the Gospels and the power that raised him from the dead. Now, that's some kind of power, I think you'd agree. And that power is available to us through the Holy Spirit. The power that resurrected Jesus can resurrect our lives as well. Not just someday in the future when we die and go to heaven, but it is available right now. See, the Holy Spirit can bring us from the depths of despair, from the depths of brokenness, and give us a new life, and give us a new beginning. It can give us hope by healing relationships, by busting through addictions, and by conquering sinful strongholds. But the problem is that this power is available to us but too often we don't tap into it. We don't make use of it. A little while ago, I met with a couple who were experiencing some pretty serious difficulties in their marriage. In the beginning of our time together, they both stated to me, Paul, faith is our number one strength as a couple, which I thought was kind of good. But then they went on to describe a relationship where there was shattered trust due to verbal abuse, due to deceit, due to accusations of infidelity and unmet expectations. After about 20 or 25 minutes of listening them to them go back and forth with one another, I finally interjected and I asked them, so tell me, how is faith being lived out in your relationship, in your marriage relationship? Because you told me it was your number one strength. Do you pray together? Do you read scripture together? Do you go to church together? I mean, it is your number one strength. But I found out all those things had fallen by the wayside. See, they were trying to do marriage under their own strength, and they were forgetting to tap into that dynamite power that was available to them through the Holy Spirit. I mean, if you look around, and you're aware of the world in which we live, we live in an era of self-help websites and seminars, apps and technology. Oh, we have social media influencers, we have self-marketers, we have standards and images that we perceive that we need to live up to, bombarding us 24-7 through our television and our computer screens, through billboards and through print media. But all of these experiences and resources are good at telling us what we have to do, but none of, us, none of them actually give us the power to do it, and that's what zaps us of life, and that's what takes the breath out of us. The Holy Spirit, though, that's what offers us power. And it's not just for our own selfish desires or for our happiness, but it's to transform our lives so that we become more like Jesus. And many of you who are listening, you know what I'm talking about. Because you have personally experienced God's Spirit and His power in your life. You have seen the way that God has brought marriages that seem beyond hope to be restored 
long and destructive patterns of behavior and addictions have been broken. Finances have been straightened out. Difficulties in relationships have been worked out. Parenting challenges have been met. See, the resurrection of Jesus matters because it reveals to us the power of God through his spirit is here and it changes lives. And that power is given to everyone who has a faith in Jesus Christ. It's available to everyone who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 7, at verse 38, Jesus says this to those gathered around him. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't just offer us power, but it also convicts us, and it helps lead us to repentance. Do you remember repentance? We talked a little about it last week. Repentance literally means that you're heading in one direction, and you turn around and you, you go in the opposite direction, 180 degrees. In, in this case, it may mean that you're heading toward a life of sin, and instead you turn around and you turn back in faith to Jesus. It, it's the Spirit that convicts us to do that. It's at work in our life that just challenges us and gets us to turn back to Christ. And that's what we experience on a daily basis when we know that we're doing something that maybe we, we don't need to do or isn't healthy for us or is against what Jesus wants us to do. And we get that feeling, that sense. And it's what convicts us to turn back to him. I'm a bit of a news junkie. You know, I subscribe to magazines and I have three subscriptions online to three different newspapers. One of them is the Toronto Sun. Now, you may also know that I'm a pretty big sports fan. So I believe that the Toronto Sun has a great sports section. But if you're familiar with the Toronto Sun, you also know that they have a daily sunshine girl. It's a section devoted to pictures of mostly scantily clad women. Now, as much as I've been successful in diverting my eyes from this section most of the time, I decided a little while ago, I need to cancel my subscription. For all the enjoyment that I get out of reading the sports section, I didn't feel it was worth the temptation of some of the other parts of the paper. See, that's the work of God's Spirit in me. It convicts me, and it leads me away from sin and to turn back in faith to Him. And that's the power, and that's the helper that lives in all of us as followers of Jesus. But we have to tap into it. Oh, there may be some times when we fall short and we give in to temptation, but that Spirit lives in us to continue to transform us, continue to remake us so that we become more like Jesus. The Spirit actually helps to put to death that old sinful nature and it resurrects a new person in us, one who is created in Christ to do good works. See, birth is not the death of us at all, as Samuel Beckett was alluding to in his, in his play Breath. Instead, birth, our new birth in Christ under the power of the Holy Spirit leads us to life. We're set free from the power of sin and we now have purposeful and meaningful and hopeful eternal life. Is that the way that you're living? And if not, that new way of living is available for you today through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is an explanation of statement number six of North Park's statement of faith. The Holy Spirit, who is the eternal Spirit of God, leads people to repentance, lives in them, and is transforming them to be more like Jesus. Which leads to the seventh and eighth statements of what we believe as a church. And that's what we'll address next week as we continue in this series. You know, as I've stated from the beginning, I'm only scratching the surface on the depth of the meaning of these statements. I want to encourage you, and I really mean this, consider doing a little bit additional study on these topics. Read a book, and if you're looking for recommendations, I can give you some recommendations. Or watch a podcast. Go on Right Now Media and subscribe to a talk based on one of these issues. Or talk to a friend, talk to a pastor, or engage in some discussion in your small group. It is so important that we get a deeper understanding because this is a declaration of what we believe as a church and therefore it should be, reflect what we believe as well. So can I ask you, do you believe this? That Jesus' resurrection proves, it proves it, that he is the Son of God and the Savior of our life. That that same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us through his Holy Spirit to transform our lives to become more like Jesus. And do you believe that life is hopeless? Life is meaningless apart from Jesus. But in him, we have hope and we have purpose and we have meaning. As a way of concluding our time together, I want to invite you to read with me the fifth and the sixth statements 
as a way of affirming that this is what we believe. We're going to read them together wherever you are. Let's read them. North Park is a non-denominational Christian church. With the whole church, we affirm the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed as foundational summaries of the Christian faith. We believe Jesus was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is the mediator between humanity and God the Father. The Holy Spirit, who is the eternal Spirit of God, leads people to repentance, lives in them, and is transforming them to be more like Jesus. North Park Church, this is what we believe. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm mindful that as I stand here right behind me is, is the cross lit up. It is the very emblem. It's the sign that's become so con- significant to our Christian faith. It represents the death of Jesus, but it also signifies that Jesus didn't stay on the cross. The cross behind me is empty. Jesus is no longer there. He's come back. You resurrected him from the dead. And because of that, that is, that is everything to our faith. Jesus' resurrection means our resurrection. It means that we are no longer dead to sin, but we are new creations in him. And I thank you for that hope, God. It is the hope that allows us to sustain whatever life throws our way. It's the hope that we take into our world that we can share with others. And it's the hope that gives our lives purpose and meaning, that you've called us to go out into our neighborhoods, our our schools, go into our workplace, our communities, and live for you to love God and to love others through our words and through our deeds. God, I thank you that you've given our life significance. And I pray for any listening to this message right now that may be dealing with with some of the the disappointment, uh, some of the sadness, some of the hopelessness that, that maybe COVID has brought their way. And God, those are real feelings. I don't want to downplay them at all. But I pray that today they understand that you are there, you are with them, you love them desperately. And through your life and your death and your resurrection, you give them new life and you give them hope. And I pray that's something that they can grasp onto today. And God, that if they need to, they can reach out, um, call the church, connect with us, and we'd love to walk with them through this journey. Thank you for this hope, God. Thank you that you've given our lives meaning. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue as we take communion. Please join us in singing to gather around the Lord's table together. the table of the Lord in our Savior's meal of grace where the broken are restored where the wanderer finds their place at the table receive the life divine by his body broken for us by his blood the crucified he 
the sinner's great reward. Pierced his feet, his hands, his side. At the table of the Lord, in his wounds the route of death. It is finished was his cry as he drew his final breath by his body. Community Church, Matt Loveday here. I am so delighted to be able to lead us in a time of uh, remembering the Lord's table together. And this is the moment where in our recording, if you need to pause and get some bread and some juice ready, you can go ahead and do that. It's also the time we like to remind everybody that coming to the Lord's table is something for all believers. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, would you please join us in this time? We also love to remind families, especially families with young kids, that if you want to participate with your kids in this time, that is completely up to you. But what an amazing opportunity this is to speak to your children about the deep love and sacrifice of Jesus. So as we come to the table here together, I'm aware that I am sitting here at my dining room table alone. Normally, communion is served by a couple of different people, and, and I was hoping actually to have my entire family here with me today to be able to lead in this time of communion, my wife Christine along with my three boys. But it just didn't work out, and so here I am alone with the bread and the cup before me. And as re I've reflected on this, I I've just been reminded that all of us know what it feels like to be alone in life, doesn't it? I mean, if nothing else, these past six months with COVID have reminded us that um, 
we can feel alone and isolated very quickly. I mean, we've been separated physically and distanced from one another. We've stayed six feet apart. We've worn masks. We haven't been able to have handshakes or give hugs. Uh, we haven't been able to invite people into our homes in the way that we're used to. And maybe this has left us feeling alone and isolated. And as I reflected on this idea of aloneness, I thought of Jesus as he approached the cross. I thought of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed alone. His disciples were not far off, but they were too tired to stay up with him. So Jesus prayed alone. I think of Jesus as he stands and faces his accusers after he'd been arrested. His disciples were scattered in fear and Jesus stands before his accusers alone. I think of Jesus on the cross, dying and about to take his last breath and crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Expressing this idea of feeling alone and even abandoned in his time of suffering. And then I think of Jesus' body in the tomb. I think of it being alone for a period of days where it was guarded by guards and a heavy stone rolled in front and Jesus' body was alone. But then I think of resurrection morning and I think of the sunrise and I think of Jesus' friends coming and finding that the stone had been rolled away. But I think that in those early moments of new life, new resurrected life that Jesus experienced, he would have had a few moments alone in that new life. And so I have all these thoughts of aloneness and yet I have this thought that Jesus understands aloneness and Jesus is with us in the midst of our feelings of aloneness. And so I thought maybe we could just take a moment of quietness, of silence, of stillness, and of solitude and spend this time reflecting personally alone on Jesus as we approach the table. So let us take a moment of silence together now. Lord God, we thank you that in all the moments of life, even the moments when we feel alone, that you are always with us. Amen. The Bible says that as Jesus shared his last supper with his disciples, he took some bread and he broke it. And he took it and he passed it to his disciples and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Take it, eat it and remember me. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. After Jesus took the bread, he took the, the cup and he said, This cup represents my blood that is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Take it, drink it, and remember me. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 15 says, in repentance and rest is our salvation. In quietness and trust is our strength. One last thought to leave you with as, as we close our time together at the Lord's table is this. That many days later when Jesus ascended back up into heaven, his disciples were once again left on the ground, feeling maybe alone, facing a future that was uncertain. And yet they were not left alone, were they? God sent the Holy Spirit to be with them, to empower them and to strengthen them to live the life that God had called them to live. And the same is true for us that no matter how alone or isolated we might feel, the truth is, is that God's Spirit is with us, that God never leaves us and never forsakes us, that He is with us, that He is strengthening us and empowering us to live the life that we have been called to live in Jesus Christ. So may we live that life together, never alone, in faith and in hope. Let us close our time by praying together. Heavenly Father, for all that lies ahead, all that is uncertain and unknown, may we be still 
and know that you are God. Lord Jesus, our Savior and Redeemer, in repentance and rest may we find our salvation, and in quietness and in trust may we find our strength. Holy Spirit, may your loving presence powerfully remind us that no matter what we face in life, that we are never, ever alone. Our most holy God, we offer up to you in this moment our hearts that are full of thankfulness and hope. Amen. Well, having focused on Jesus, let us close by continuing to just focus our thoughts and attentions on him. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. This world, give me Jesus. When I am cold, oh, when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, give me Jesus. Christ goes with you. Grace and peace go with you.